and good morning everyone happy tuesday morning welcome back to morning musings my name is don k preston i am the president of preterist research institute of ardmore oklahoma and we are continuing our examination uh comparing scripture with scripture comparing joel chapter 3 with revelation well we're going to get to revelation this morning but specifically matthew chapter 25 31 and following i, I had revelation on my, on my mind because that's where we are going and the reason we're doing that is this. Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following depicts the coming of Christ in the day of the Lord and the gathering of the nations. Now, I don't know of anyone that denies this is the time of the end time harvest, right? Well, that means it's the fulfillment of Sukkot, the feast of Sukkot, which foreshadowed the end time resurrection. So let's not lose sight of that at all. This is the, the uh, gathering together of Matthew 24, 31. When the Son of Man was sent forth his angels with the sound of the great trumpet, and they shall gather to gather the elect from the four winds, from the four corners of the earth. Well, that word, the, the term gather to gather is from the Greek, pardon me, from the Greek word episunagogi. And it means just what it, it's translated, to gather, to gather. It's, it's a compound word, epi, on, you know, heaped up, gathering. Highly, highly significant word. It is used in the great, great majority of its occurrences, but, well, you know, it's used constantly in the Old Testament to speak of the last days, resurrection, gathering. The regathering of Israel out of exile at the coming of the Messiah and the kingdom. An incredibly important word. Well, that's what, that's what Matthew 25, 31 is all about. It's the end times episunagogi. So, with that said, what we have is Matthew chapter 25, depicting the final harvest. And again, I don't know of anyone that denies that. It's the coming of the Lord at the end of the age and the Son of Man sending forth his reapers at the end time gathering. Now, in Matthew 13, the gathering is the suligo. A different word, same meaning. All right? So, what is absolutely fascinating is that I've been sharing with you how Joel chapter 2 and 3 is an example of protracted or projected, I should say, eminence. The prophet projects himself into the last days and he predicts the events of the last days. Now, notice what happens. Uh, and boy, this is, I tell you, this is this is really interesting. Proclaim this among the nations. Now, mind you, he's not speaking to Israel here. He's talking about the nations. And let's not forget it. It's about the day of the Lord. About the day of the Lord that in the last days would be near. So here is the Lord preparing, urging, telling the nations, prepare for war. But he's talking about the day of the Lord. You know, the, this is not a digression. This is actually quite critical. In the Old Testament, in the Tanakh, the day of the Lord was a time of war. I don't know anywhere that that is better illustrated than in Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 6. The Lord spoke to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and their prophets. And the Lord said, O Jerusalem, all of your prophets are evil. They speak, but they only speak for themselves. They do not speak of me. They are like deceitful foxes. They do not go up to the city 
and prepare the breaches in the wall to prepare for the day of the Lord. Say what? No, wait a minute. I was raised believing the, the day of the Lord is the end of time. And it's over in a boom, in a moment, in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye. And yet now, in Jeremiah chapter 13, the Lord said, here's the problem. The prophets of Jerusalem, they're doing what they're doing for personal gain. They're not preparing the people for the day of the Lord. How would they prepare the people for the day of the Lord? Oh, by repairing the walls of Jerusalem for defensive purposes. Now, you know, I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure you're pretty sure, <laughs> if the day of the Lord was an earth-burning, time-ending event in which Yahweh and, or in which Jesus comes out of heaven riding on a cumulus cloud and he destroys heaven and earth with the word of his mouth in an instant, I'm pretty sure that fortifying this fortifying the walls of Jerusalem with mud, brick, mortar. Yeah, pretty sure that wouldn't do much good. Don't you feel that way? Don't you know that to be the truth? Of course you do. This should force us to rethink our concepts about the identity of the day of the Lord. Just, just go back there and read Jeremiah 13, verse, verse 6. So, here in Joel chapter 3, we have the Lord not speaking to Israel. He's not speaking to Jerusalem. He is speaking to the nations. Do you see that? Declare this among the nations. Prepare for war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Watch this. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Assemble and come up, all you nations. Gather to gather all around. See, this is verse 14 of gathering the nations to the valley of Jehoshaphat. This is chapter 3, or this, yes, chapter 3, verse 1 and 2. In those are days and at that time, I will gather all nations for judgment. This gathering of the nations for war is Revelation chapter 16. The kings of the, e of the east gathering themselves together at the river Euphrates for the battle of Armageddon, which didn't actually take place because God put an end to it. Do you see how the focus here is not specifically on Israel and Jerusalem, except in this sense? It's the call to battle against Jerusalem at this point. Oh, and inclusive of Tyre and Sidon, as we saw yesterday, caught up in this conflagration, this time of battle, but this is calling the nations to battle. And I think it's so ironic, beat your plowshares into swords, beat your pruning hooks into spears, just the opposite you see of Isaiah chapter 2, 3 and 4, verse 4 specifically. So here's what we have. We have Joel 2 and 3 predicting a time of warfare in the last days. It would be a time of warfare against the enemies of God as well as a time of judgment on Jerusalem as we will see this week. All right? So, we've already seen from Matthew 11, 20 and following, Matthew 12, 38 and following, how Tyre and Sidon would rise up in judgment. 
Sodom and Gomorrah would rise up in judgment with the first century generation. I demonstrated for you from Josephus how Chorazin and Bethsaida were judged in the first century. You see, all of these are conflated. These are not disparate, widely separated events, temporally speaking. It's still set in the last days and at that time. And thus, what does that mean? That means that Matthew chapter 25, of the gathering of the nations for the judgment, as foretold in Joel, and as commented on by Jesus. And tomorrow, I'm going to show you how Joel chapter 3 plays a vital, integral part in properly understanding the book of Revelation. I didn't get there this morning, did I? I'll get there in the morning, okay? So, in the meantime, get a copy of my book, Who is This Babylon?, in which, to set the stage for tomorrow, I will be discussing Joel chapter 3, the harvest, Revelation 14, the harvest, and Matthew chapter 25, 31 and following, i.e., the harvest. You don't want to miss it, so I'll see you on the flip side.